So yesterday we started, or we talked about finite state machines, or FSMs. Um, so FSMs are a method of building up a lot of the sequential stuff we've used to generate sequential designs that accomplish some goal. Um, you're given a general method for solving these types of problems, which we'll go through a quick example with. Um, step one was said to be understanding the problem. Step two, from the problem definition, we figure out what are ways to accomplish this with state. So this is the initial state diagram. Um, step three is we optimize that to create what we would call a minimized state diagram, which is basically a more logical way um, of doing it. There's no formal process for generating this from two and three. It's two is more brainstorming, three is more thinking in a design perspective. Um, step four, five, and six, this is where we are actually implementing it. So in step four, we go from the arbitrary states we defined to a states that we can represent in binary, and we draw a table showing how we change from those binary states. Um, step five and six are then where we implement it with the chosen technology. Um, what we're actually going to learn today is basically, so I'll review all of these steps before, but steps one, two, and three are going to stay the same, and step four, five, and six, we're going to learn about um, some computer tools, basically, to make this all a lot easier. Um, so we have this example of a vending machine that requires $1.25. Um, if you had a loony and a quarter input, then we would have some sensors saying you have a loony, you have a quarter, um, and when a dollar twenty-five has been inserted of some combination, it opens a gate. Um, so there's different combinations, for example, you could use to generate that money, and it doesn't give you change if you overpay. Um, so from that, we had the idea, well, you could just create a state for every possible transition. Um, which would be fairly complicated because, you know, we have, okay, loony, quarter, quarter, loony, um, quarter, 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 etc. So you'll end up with a lot of enumerations, not even more if it's something like quarter, 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 loony. And there's just too many states. So a minimized diagram would be to represent each state as an amount of money, and depending on the inputs, you transition between those. So if the... If I'm going to say I'm going to use the loony quarter, so if you put in a loony, you move to there. If you just put in a quarter, you move like this. Um, and with this way, we can transition between all of the different states, including, say, if you put in three quarters and a loony, even though you overpay, we're just saying you move like that. Um, so in this way, it's covering a lot more of the options with only these uh, six states. Step three, we create a symbolic table. So this table is the exact same as that previous diagram where we're saying, you know, from the um, zero cent state, if you put in a loony, you move to the one dollar state. Or if you're in the 50 cent state, you put in a quarter, you move to the 75 cent state. Um, so this is just written out in table form instead of the state diagram. We perform state assignments. So for example, instead of 75 cents, which is our arbitrary understanding of the problem, we say that's represented by binary 0, 1, 1. Um, and if you replace the symbolic states with binary, you end up with that. So if we're in this state, which you know it's the same thing, 0 cents, 25 cents, 50 cents, 75 cents, dollar, dollar 25. So if we're in the state 0, 1, 1, equivalent to 75 cents, and you put in a quarter, you move to state 1, 0, 0, which is equivalent to a dollar. So this representation is something a computer could understand. Um, we choose the flip-flops. So the flip-flops are how we're going to move from the present state to the next state. This is just like when you're designing a counter, you count up, you go from one state to another state. When we're counting, we always move. The difference with the FSM is that there's some inputs, and they decide 
if you move, and potentially you might move to, you know, not just the next state, but you could skip states or move backwards. Um, with D flip-flops, the design is simplified because at the entry to each of the flip-flops, the required input is just the required next state. It's one and the same. Um, so when you're designing the logic, you can just say, okay, the input to the flip-flop is the required next state, is the required output. Um, if you're doing JK, the problem is the required input is something else. Um, so, for example, if we require to move to the state zero here, um, and the input, the current state is zero, then you have to consult the table and say, okay, well, J is zero, and K is actually don't care. So you put that in. So you see that you have, for each state, two inputs to the flip-flop. Um, because of all these don't cares in the entries, you'll end up with a simplified logic because you have lots of don't cares. You'll end up with KMAP with lots of terms grouped together. Um, the disadvantage is it's more complicated to design with because we have all these extra um, outputs to create for. Um, and just like with the counters, we use KMAX to create the logic for the inputs to the flip-flops and for the output. So in general, you remember with a FSM, we have flip-flops, and these store the state variables. Um, you know, so say this is state variable A, B, C. So there's three bits of state. Um, so we design logic here. We design logic here. Um, and these are the outputs. These are the inputs. And this logic also knows the current state. And then that logic is driving whatever the flip-flop inputs are. You know, if it's D flip-flop, just the D input. If it's JK, there's two inputs to each flip-flop. And based on this current state and these inputs, it's going to create the proper transition to the next state. Um, it should be obvious, yeah, sure, it will be once you go through some examples, that when we chose how to encode the states, when I said, um, you know, zero cents is zero, 25 cents is zero, zero, one, there's a lot of options. I could have made 25 cents, um, one, zero, zero so forth. And this will change, for example, here when I'm moving states. Um, if I encoded 25 cent as 111 instead of 101, um, this would change the transition table. And this may result in simpler logic. So if I just arbitrarily choose it, I'm probably not going to have the best implementation. And there's computer tools that can help you do that. So I had the design example of a stoplight, um, which just cycles through green, yellow, red, waiting on green for 10 seconds. Um, and here we said, well, initially you may decide to go through tons of different states where you know, we'll have 10 green states. So it's every second, because we said we had a one hertz clock, it's going to move through these states that are tracking. It's been green for one second, green for two seconds, green for three seconds, green for four, etc. cetera. Um, but the problem is this is going to create a fairly complex state machine because we'll have so many states and they're not really doing a lot. That one's just tracking that it's been green for so long. Um, so a better design might be to just minimize it and keep it as green, yellow, red, um, with the addition of an extra input that wasn't specified in the problem. So you might say, we're going to add a counter. And when the counter is equal to 10, we transition out of the green state. Um, this also means because we have an external counter here, this counter is going to need a reset. Otherwise, it will count to 10 and just keep counting. Um, so you'll have to design logic to drive that reset. So you'll also have to design this logic that gives you counter output, 4-bit counter. Wait, so 
Um, and for example, we know we want it to match at 10, so when it's 101. Um, so you could do something like that. Oh, thank you. So this just means that you know you can take some liberty. So the problem definition is given to you. It doesn't mean you just have to use the states as they seem to want you to. You can simplify things. So this is the count equals 10. Um, and we'll feed that into the state machine. So then we can have this state transition table. Um, here I've already assigned the state. So we can see this is the red state. We have green, north, south, green, north, south, um, yellow, north, south, red, green, east, west, yellow, east, west. Uh, and this table is showing you, for example, that if we're in the red state, we always just transition to the green state. We don't care about that, that count equals 10 input. Um, if we're in the green state, we only transition out of it when count equals 10 is equal to 1. Um, so that's the state transition table. We use D flip-flops again because it's then a just a, uh, from the state transition table, the problem becomes taking these four input variables, design the logic to create this output variable, and that's it. You don't have to worry about the J and K outputs. Um, so you can do the K mapping technique as before. I just take those, input them all. Um, I haven't enumerated every possibility for A, B, C, D here, you notice. Obviously, there's 16 poss uh, possibilities, but I haven't shown them all. So, and part of it's because there's these don't cares. Part of it's because not every state's used. Um, so what I've done is I've drawn in everything that's shown in that truth table, and all these blanks become don't cares. Because those are where there weren't every state used. Um, so you can just enumerate the whole table if you want. And then you can do normal k-mapping techniques, so there's a simplified version. And um, this is an example, by the way, with the k-map, I've said before, it's not always a best solution per se, because you could have taken it to be like that instead. Um, and in that case, it's still a group of four and a group of four. Um, the implementation I've chosen happens to be hazard-free in that case, although it shouldn't really be an issue for what we're doing, because if you see a glitch for a second in the output, it shouldn't really matter. Um, same thing with the B state and the C state. So this is telling you the logic for each of the uh, flip-flop inputs. Once you have this, you can generate the output logic. So the output logic is just saying, based on the current state, um, what are the output variables? So for example, if we're in the red state, it's red both ways, and that's it. Um, and that's the same thing for, there's two red states, as you can see. And same thing for the green state and yellow state. Um, we also have this reset output. I mentioned before we have the counter that'll be reset. So when we count up to 10, we want to reset it and then count to 10. Uh, so I've just told it to reset in the red state, and then when it gets to green, it'll start counting. Um, you could, you know, for example, in the yellow state, you don't really care, so you could make that don't cares if you wanted, um, and it should still work. Those are just different simplifications. Um, I've also enumerated, as I mentioned before, there is some other states, some um, invalid states. And you'll notice that even in these invalid states, I'm forcing the output to be a certain value. Um, the reason being that if it's something that's safety critical, you'll want to define everything, even if they shouldn't happen. Uh, because it may, there may be a hardware fault that's actually causing one of these states to occur. Um, you know, unintended logic might happen, things like that. If you're designing for space applications, for example, there's single event upsets can happen where um, a particle of radiation can strike your chip and actually flip a bit internally. Even though you're not doing anything, the register just becomes a one. Um, 
So there is a lot of applications where you really have to consider what happens in unintended states or even if transitions happen at the wrong time. Um, so this is showing some of the K-maps, again, for the red, yellow, and green. Yellow and green are only one for a specific case, so that's all you can really do with the simplification. There's the reset. And then here's the implementation. So you can see we have these three flip-flops, the A, B, and C state. Um, and you can see all the clocks are connected together, so they all clock at the same time. That's... It's important with flip-flops, you always have that clock um, to, because that's what's driving the input to the output. So they're all synchronized and they all change at the same point. Um, and you can see, for example, this logic here that's implementing the B and C, and then A and C, and then ORing them together. Um, so that's the logic we figured out that exists for the... Here, so that's this, A plus is equal to that, and you can see where that logic is directly implemented. Um, and in the same way, there's the other logic for the rest of the input. So this is the logic for B plus, this is the logic for C plus, so C plus is going here. Um, in the same way, we have the output logic all here. Um, so this is for the different LEDs. Um, so the red, green, yellow, etc. LEDs. So that's all the output logic implemented there. And finally here, we have the counter that I've put down. So this is the binary counter. Um, and when it counts to 10, this output goes high. And you can see we have the logic I talked about before that's resetting it or clearing it um, to zero. So when the light's red, it starts at zero. As soon as the light turns green, it starts counting up. And that's how it manages the state transition. Um, and you can see a simulation result of it, and I showed yesterday the physical board working. Uh, so you can see, for example, the red LEDs, um, green goes here, and then this is actually showing the internal, that D variable too, which is the count, so you can see at this point count is equal to 10. Um, and when count is equal to 10, we go from green to yellow to red. Um, so the whole state machine is working as expected. Uh, with the schematic I was using, and I showed you yesterday the full procedure, um, this idea that there's just net names, so the, all these names are connected together. You know, all these Bs are physically wired together. Rather than showing you this mess of wires, I've just named them B. Um, and there's a procedure given for renaming the nets. Types of state machines, there is the mealy machine, where the outputs depend on the state and on the inputs. Um, so with the mealy machine, we have this notation um, saying that, well, here, I'll show you the more first. With the more machine, where the outputs depend only on state, we have, you know, state zero. And if the input's one, it moves to state one. If we're in state one and the input's zero, it moves to state zero, and that's it. The output depends solely on the state. So if we're in state zero, the output's zero. If we're in state one, the output's one. With a mealy machine, um, the output depends on the state and the inputs. So here we can see if we're in state zero and the input's one, the output becomes one. Um, and then if we're in state one and the output's still one, it then becomes zero. So the output's changing dependent on both the state and input variables. Um, and I had an example for a controller with a lamp with on and off push buttons. Um, and when you just press a button for a moment, it sort of latches that. And when you release it, it stays in that state. I also wanted there to be a buzzer so that the buzzer would go on whenever there's a state change. Um, and when we have the state transition diagram for the mealy machine, what you see is there's just the two states. There's an on state and there's an off state. When you're in the on state, and this is the off push button, I believe. Yes. And this is the on button. Um, and you press the off button, you transition to the off state. 
once we're in the off state, you know, you can hit the off button again, it does nothing, or you can release the button, it does nothing. The difference is that when you press the button in the on state, the output variable goes to one, so the buzzer goes to one, and when you press the off button in the off state, the buzzer is zero, it doesn't actually do anything. Um, to do the same thing with a more machine, you would need extra states because all the output variables can only depend on the current state. So we need the on state. We need to go to a beep state just for, you know, temporarily. And then we always transition from that beep state out of it to the off state. Um, so we need this extra state to actually have that beep work. So what you see, for example, if you have a state transition table, uh, for the mealy machine, we just have one bit for the state and then on and off variables. So when you were designing this, you know, the K map has three input variables, current state on and off, and one output variable, the next state. Um, so it's quite simple. You just need to do one K map of two by the two by one looking one, so the smaller K map. Um, and then there will be two output K maps as well. For the more one, because we have four states, we actually need two bits, which means in total there'll be a four-bit k map. Um, and then you'll have to do that twice because the next state also will have two bits in it. So it becomes more slightly more complicated design process. Um, so typically this is what you'll see for a lot of designs is the mealy machine has less states because it's dependent on the input variables and the more machine will have more states. With the mealy machine, we'll often end up with the asynchronous output, and you can see this here, for example. So this output, for example, if this was the buzzer output, it depends on the current state, which is fine. That changes every, or it could change on every clock cycle. But it's also directly dependent on the input variable. Um, so in cases like this, you still have the potential, you know, if the input variable changes for a split second, you may see things like this output variable will change um, before this one changes, or that split second, you know, if you just pulse it on, it may not be registered by this flip-flop because it may not be on that clock edge, um, and the result is you get some glitch on the output. And it depends if you care about that or not. If you don't, then why bother with the extra work? Um, and you can use the mealy machine. The more machine, it's dependent solely on the state variable, so you can see that it'll only change on clock edges. When you encode the state, we have the options. There's binary encoding, which is what we've been using. So, you know, you just encode it as a binary number, which is easy for design. One hot, where you have as many bits as there are states, and only one of those bits is one, and that one represents the current state. This is the implementation runs way faster for one hot encoding um, because you can directly read out the states. You know, if you have four bits, you can, if you have a one there, you can just connect all the logic for state four to this one bit. You don't need logic to decode the current state and then act upon it. Um, so what this means in the end is you'll have less levels of logic and it's faster then because it runs through quicker. Gray coding, um, for some state machines, you when we have the output logic, you know, if we have a lot of output logic depending on many states, um, this logic can still glitch because the states, if you, you know, you have three flip-flops, and several of them are changing at once, they may not change at exactly the same instant. There may be nanoseconds difference, um, which may generate a glitch if we're moving, you know, from one zero to zero one. As I showed yesterday, there's going to be some intermediate time, potentially. Um, so we're going from one zero to zero one, but for this intermediate time, it's actually 1-1, one, one. so your logic can read that and may act upon it falsely. With gray encoding, what we're doing is we're trying to make sure that each state transition only has one bit difference, so we use the gray code for that. 
Um, again, it depends on what you're doing with the output logic and how it's designed, but for some applications, you might need that. All right, so that's all from yesterday's stuff. Take a quick break if we want. Um,